Uh, then we we move on to uh, the types, the types of cardiac failure as we mentioned in our uh, learning objectives, uh, based on pathophysiology and disease outcomes. So under these two headings, these are pathophysiology headings, and the disease outcome uh, will be discussed at the end. Okay. Uh, now high and low output failure. What are what is high uh, metabolic or high output failure is basically when the heart. I have mentioned this in the causes. Basically, there's just uh, 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 too much demand uh, uh, in terms of cardiac output in an otherwise normal heart. So if you have severe anemia, pyrotoxicosis, or uh, uh, atrial ventricular shunt, uh, this is a high metabolic state, and the heart failure will be a high, high output failure, as opposed to a low output failure, which basically means that the heart is, is, is in, in itself has been damaged and, and uh, maybe due to ischemic heart disease or a cardiomyopathy, it has dilated to the point that it's not, it cannot properly contract. So the problem is within the heart itself and it's unable to provide uh, a, the normal needs of the body. Again, this is the same information, uh, but given in, in a different, uh, let's say we are looking at it at the same information that we've been discussing up till now, but in a slightly more clinical uh, point of view. Okay, so this is this is one way to classify uh, the, the the cardiac failure. Another way to classify cardiac failure is to describe it as a systolic and diastolic function. Um, so you have a situation where there's a systolic failure, which basically means that the contraction profile of the heart has been damaged. So the heart is not contracting enough enough blood, as opposed to a diastolic failure, which basically means that it's not being filled properly. Both are unique, uh, both are different uh, in, in their detail. So a, a very briefly, a systolic failure uh, basically will ensue when the heart itself has been damaged by again, an, uh, ischemic heart disease or cardiomyopathy. There's a valvular defect, uh, uh, stenosis or regurgitation, uh, or there is uh, hypertension, which basically means that the heart overload has increased so much that it's now uh, having trouble uh, contracting against it. Uh, so all of this basically, all of these things that I've just mentioned under the systolic failure, they lead to decreased ejection fraction. Okay, you know what ejection fraction is, decreased ejection fraction, which then leads to increased EDV and diastolic volume, i.e. pooling of blood within the heart, in, increase, increased ventricular dilatation. The heart is now expanding because of that pooling of blood and there is increased wall tension without proper systole. Okay, all of this is bad for its oxygen consumption. The oxygen consumption goes up. Any coronary uh, event can then lead to a very lethal outcome in this scenario. Okay, uh, coming to diastolic failure, which basically will hover around anything which leads to decreased filling of the ventricles during diastole. Uh, you have, you may have a, a, a decreased chamber size. Uh, by chamber, I mean ventricular chamber. You, you can have a, uh, a ventricular hypertrophy scenario in the sense that it has uh, expanded the whole muscle of the, uh, the, uh, the ventricle has, has hypertrophied, remodeled in such a way that it, it doesn't just protrude out, it also produces inwards, decreasing the, the, the chamber uh, where the blood would have accumulated. So chronic hypertrophy uh, 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 scenarios basically also decrease chamber size and lead to can lead to diastolic failure this happens in chronic heart failures or chronic uh, uh, chronic uh, cases where the heart is um, gradually uh, giving out gradually uh, decreasing in function basically with aging with aging okay and uh, you have uh, the cardiac remodeling happening all the time it, it slightly increases in size but eventually obviously it will uh, be a bad thing uh, and again something related with aging uh, uh, there is there was nothing wrong with the chap throughout throughout, throughout his life uh, but aging itself is a problem in the sense that it decreases ventricular wall compliance the ability to stretch contract and relax contract and uh, relax it it needs a a very uh, healthy uh, agile myocardium which due to age the actin myosin filaments they basically um, age out or they become they, they don't they're not very uh, efficient in doing their function 
uh, with the passage of years and in itself then this is a problem um, in this type of failure you have congestive symptoms uh, uh, more uh, in here systolic you have the decreased edv so decreased cardiac output is the is the main feature of systolic failure but in the diastolic failure you have more of the uh, fluid retention uh, side of things uh, which is obvious uh, and all sorts of problems with uh, say mitral stenosis or cardiac myopathy with hypertrophy uh, or with IHT, all are features, are, all can feature a diastolic failure component. Then we've already discussed uh, compensated cardiac failure uh, in this uh, cardiac output may become normal eventually, uh, but at the, at the cost of a raised right art, art, uh, arterial pressure, uh, atrial pressure of your body and decreased exercise tolerance. Uh, which basically the cardiac reserve, it basically means the ability to increase cardiac output in a normal person. You can really increase uh, the, the cardiac output many, many folds uh, in a normal person, while in an athlete, it's many hundreds of folds you can increase the cardiac profile, the cardiac output. Uh, but in, in, in that context, in a patient with cardiac failure, the cardiac reserve, i.e. the ability to improve cardiac failure in various uh, situations decreases tremendously. So while compensated heart is, you can live with that, uh, but you need to be careful about uh, your exercise, okay? And remember, it's set at a higher right atrial pressure. Uh, so that's, that's you, you'll always have a situation where fluid retention or edema uh, can set in in your patient and he needs to be or she needs to be um, uh, educated about this. And then finally, decompensated uh, heart failure, which uh, uh, which has no compensation, fluid retention becomes vicious. We've already discussed this uh, in in rather detail. Okay, so uh, we are moving now to the, to the, to the conclusion of this uh, lecture. Uh, we'll just uh, wrap up uh, by looking at clinical manifestations of right and left cardiac failure. So remember, uh, although uh, most of the cardiac failure basically does not have geographical boundaries as such. Uh, but sometimes uh, it so happens that if a, a side of the heart, one side of the heart is, is much more affected uh, or to the exclusion of the other, other side of the heart. So maybe uh, the right side is more affected, the right ventricle is more affected uh, while the left ventricle is fine or uh, in most cases the left ventricle is more affected than the right ventricle. Why is the left ventricle most affected in most of the cases? Is because the left ventricle's work, cardiac work, uh, is much more against uh, a, a increased afterload. Remember, the aorta uh, is uh, is much more. Uh, what should I say? Uh, working against the, against the aorta is a bigger issue than working against the lungs. Basically, the lungs uh, vasculature, the pulmonary vasculature, has a has a high compliance, low resistance. So, right ventricle is. Is, uh, is a happy place, <laughs> so to say. The left ventricle has to uh, withstand uh, the pressures of the aorta, which is uh, formidable and can be formidable if there is even a slight change in the valve or in the aortic pressures uh, as is uh, in early uh, onset hypertension. All sorts of issues or all sorts of pressure uh, is, is exerted on the left ventricle. So you have more MIs on the left side than the right side. However, uh, for descriptive purposes, we just uh, list down everything that happens purely, say, in a right heart failure. You'll have congestion of peripheral vessels. You can imagine whatever was coming up the ladder to the heart has basically come under pressure. You would have all sorts of uh, edema, ascites, collection of fluid inside the abdomen. Uh, the GI tract, gastrointestinal tract will be congested. You will have all sorts of issues. Uh, these are the symptoms. Uh, weight loss, uh, 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 Distress, general distress of uh, the, the, the gastrointestinal tract. You have liver congestion, uh, signs of impaired liver function. They are there. Uh, so this is basically if the right heart goes out. Coming to the left heart, basically you have the two main headings are decreased output and decreased output basically means that you will have issues with tissue perfusion of the entire body. So it's, it's, a, it's a big issue here. And uh, inactive uh, activity intolerance means the lack of increasing your uh, exercise profile. So 
while you would uh, climb upstairs uh, or or walk briskly. Uh, but now in cardiac failure, if it's especially the light left left heart failure, uh, you will find it very very difficult to even do mundane activities. Okay. The second component is of pulmonary congestion, and this is a world of itself. Uh, of course, uh, you have done respiratory physiology. You now understand uh, the the perils of uh, pulmonary edema, which uh, we but we discussed when we were covering those those points in class. Uh, impaired gas exchange, uh, cyanosis, signs of hypoxia. All of this now should be clear. Uh, you have signs of hypoxia. Why is there impaired gas uh, exchange? Is because now you have fluid uh, in the pulmonary membrane inside the pulmonary membrane, which has increased the area across which gases need to to, to transfer. And for oxygen, we we went into details describing that there is an optimal distance that means that the body maintains between the closest uh, uh, blood vessel and the nearby tissue. If you increase this this uh, this area, this space, or this distance. Basically, you are increasing, uh, uh, you're decreasing diffusion across uh, this uh, this new new geography, and this will impair any gas exchange that takes place. Pulmonary edema itself then uh, uh, causes all sorts of symptoms. Uh, this person will have a very typical cough, a very fruity uh, type of cough. Uh, it will be exact. Uh, the the difficulty in uh, breathing will be especially at night because you'll be lying down and the fluid uh, will, will, will favor filling the lung in a, in a, in a bad way. Uh, the dyspnea, the, i.e. the difficulty in breathing will, will happen at night. Uh, and then there is all sorts of, uh, uh, this, this back your pardon, is the, is the, the, tunnel, is the night, nighttime uh, dyspnea. Uh, the, there will be problem with uh, difficulty in breathing uh, related to posture as well. So this is basically the right and the left side failure and the clinical manifestations right from the symptoms, these are the symptoms and the underlying physiological concepts. We then conclude by mentioning cardiogenic shock. Shock basically uh, means circulatory shock. And one of the, this is, a, this is the last topic of circulatory, uh, circulatory unit which we'll be discussing tomorrow. Uh, circulatory shock has many uh, headings and many causes. One of the cause of circulatory shock is the heart itself, where the heart uh, gave in and resulted in uh, resulting in cardio in, in a circulatory shock. Uh, circulatory shock basically is when the circulation fails to provide for the tissue, oxygen and food substrates, and removing uh, the, the the waste material, carbon dioxide and all that sort of thing. Uh, so if that circulatory failure uh, is not uh, uh, due to any failing of the circulation itself, but rather due to the heart that is pumping blood uh, uh, in the circulation, we call it a specialized type of shock called cardiogenic shock. Okay? Uh, MI is the most common cause of this. And what are the features? Uh, obviously, the first feature will be cardiac, decreased cardiac output. Uh, which leads to hypotension, decreased blood pressure, uh, increased uh, uh, total peripheral resistance, which is due to sympathetic stimulation, obviously. Because as soon as you go, to, you went into hypotension, the better receptor reflex triggered, uh, trying to increase cardiac output and causing vasoconstriction of the arterioles, which in this particular scenario, usually it's good. But in this uh, scenario where the heart itself uh, is the is the villain or is is the is is the injured person not the person the organ uh, increasing TPR basically will translate into increasing afterload for this uh, 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 troubled heart. Okay, so in this scenario, sympathetic stimulation uh, besides improving uh, blood pressure to an extent actually uh, causes problems by increasing afterload. Uh, the preload also increases because there is more blood coming through now, uh, which is not being sorted out by the failing heart. It starts pooling. The whole story, which you already now know of cardiac failure, also is shared by uh, cardiac shock. And uh, finally, uh, the end systolic volume is increased because it's not pumping enough blood forwards, uh, which then uh, increase it due to increase in offload, 
and it is an octotic function. So basically ESV adds to the uh, diastolic volume already present in the heart. And so a, a, a negative cycle uh, is established within the heart of increasing fluid. And this adds to the woes of this failing heart. So a failing heart can go into a number one, fail itself to do its job. Number two, uh, can then trigger a shock-like situation in the circulation where the person will have uh, cardiac failure features and features of shock, which in this case will overlap. From tomorrow, we'll discuss, when we discuss circulatory shock, you will be, uh, you, you will further clear out this concept of how shock is a separate entity from failure. Uh, this is literally the boundary of cardiac failure and circulatory shock. Both features are present because Heart is involved in this. When you look at more circulatory type of shock, pure circulation, circulatory type of shock where um, the heart is okay, then you'll be able to appreciate what shock itself is. These are references. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.